Hey, good morning again. How's everybody doing? Good. Wow, that was weak. <laughs> weak. So that bad, huh? Good stuff. Uh, well, hey, this morning we are continuing on in our series uh, on Acts, the beginning of a movement, the, the, the church of God moving forward. The first week we talked about uh, the purpose of the church and the church being here to glorify God through the making of disciples. And then last week we talked about the plan of the church. Uh, which is to start right where you're at. And then today we're talking about the power of the church, the Holy Spirit empowering the people of God to do what God has called us to do. And, and I think when I look at uh, some of the other snippets in the book of Acts, when I look at the early church and I look at certain points through church history, I really see the Spirit of God moving. Like the early church is all like demons coming out of people and the lame are walking and all sorts of cool stuff is happening. And then you get to the Reformation. There's obviously cool stuff that happens in, in the Middle Ages as well. Uh, but you get the Reformation and like there's cool stuff happening there. There's the nailing of documents to church doors, uh, which doesn't sound exciting, but it really is. And, and then there's the, the Great Awakening. There's the Billy Graham Crusade. And I, and I think we get to the point here in our modern day where we kind of feel like the church lost momentum, like slowed down maybe, a little bit. Uh, and I'm a nerd, and I like uh, books about old, old wooden ships. Uh, and old, old wooden ships are wind-powered. Uh, and wind-powered ships, when they don't have the wind pushing them, uh, go through this thing called being becalmed. And becalmed is one of the worst things you can be out in the middle of the ocean, because you're just at the mercy of nothingness, just kind of out there, adrift, waiting for the wind to pick back up. And I think a lot of us feel like the church has become becalmed. We're becalmed in the middle of the sea of culture and change and pandemics, which just kind of feel maybe a little powerless. And maybe you feel becalmed in your own life. Maybe you feel as though life has kind of reached this uh, sort of ebb of momentum, of powerlessness, and you don't feel like you have the, the momentum, the effort, the power uh, to really carry you through another day. And so today what I want us to talk about as we look at cha Acts chapter 8 is the power of the church. And the power of the church, as I said, is the Holy Spirit. And he does not become becalmed. He's always on the move. He's always working. And because if you are a follower of Jesus, you're a member of the church, which means you're part of the body of believers. And so we have power, and as, as a person, you have power. So let's talk about that today. And what I want us to do is I want us to compare in four ways how power from the Holy Spirit is different than the worldly power we experience. Power is not bad. It's neither good. It's a neutral thing. It's how we use it that makes it good or evil. So let's look at the first comparison in Acts chapter 8. Slavery versus freedom. Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. And Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. And there was much joy in the city." Now, we've skipped a little bit of the action here, but what's happened is uh, the church has come under persecution in Jerusalem, and so uh, the, the church is scattered, and it's gone out to different places, and here we see Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. We see the church is in Samaria. Philip has gone there. He's one of the deacons that was appointed with uh, Stephen and some others. And so uh, the church of God has gone into uh, a city, and we, we think it's either a major city of the region of Samaria, or it's actually the city known as Samaria. Either way, the gospel of God throughout Acts tends to go into major metropolitan areas. In our day and age, we tend to think of the church as being really influential in the rural parts of our country, but in the cities, it bears less influence. That is not how the gospel of God actually works. The gospel of God is just as powerful in the city as it is in the rural areas, but particularly in the early church, as the gospel is moving forward, they take it into the city centers. They take it to the very seats of power where economic power, religious power, political power rested in these places, and the gospel of God went directly into those places and challenged the establishment. The gospel is revolutionary, and it doesn't shy away from that. It goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with these institutions of power. And that's what Philip does when he takes it into Samaria. And so Philip shows up and he starts working miracles. He starts proclaiming the gospel. He, he casts out demons. And all this other stuff is going on around it. And people are pumped. It's like full on joy, flooding the city. Everybody's excited. And this is one of those things that tells us a little bit about power in the church. 
Power from the Spirit will always lead to freedom. Whereas power that's abused, worldly power will always lead to enslavement. Lead to people coming into bondage. And you see this here. You see people being set free. These people in Samaria, they had experienced power in their life. Because we'll read on a little bit later that there's this guy there named Simon who works all these kinds of miracles and powers. But for some reason, they're all still enslaved to these demons and, and, and uh, crippling diseases and things like that. So why can't he set them free? Because the power of God is the power of freedom. And so the Spirit of God comes, moves in their lives, and sets them free. You see, wherever you see injustice in the world, wherever you look and you say, that's not right, people shouldn't be treated that way, somebody has abused the power that they've been given. Somebody has abused and, create, and, and used their power to make themselves or their group of people more powerful, more influential than another group of people. And people have suffered for it. Andy Crouch writes an excellent book called Playing God. Uh, it's fantastic. If you want to read a book about power and, and sort of the dynamics of power and what's the difference between godly power and, and, and not godly power, I can't recommend him enough. Any of his books are awesome. Uh, but he talks about in his book, he says uh, that the poverty, the poor, are poor because somebody has tried to play God in their lives. Totally makes sense. Think about your own life. Where do you try to play God? Where do you try to control people? Where do you try to manipulate people? Where do you try to hoard resources so that you and yours are taken care of as opposed to not doing those things? Does our power lead to freedom or does it lead to enslavement? Look what happens when freedom comes to town. Verse 7, For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed, so there was much joy in the city. The Spirit of God floods into the city through Philip's work, and people are set free. Freedom and the Spirit go hand in hand. You see it throughout Scripture, 2 Corinthians 3.17, Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is Freedom. Romans 8, 2, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. And then joy tags along as well. Acts 13, 52, describes the apostles as being filled with the Holy Spirit and with joy. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have the power of the Holy Spirit, the power that gives freedom in your life, lives inside of you. So let me ask you this, have you experienced this freedom? Are you free from addiction? Are you free from depression and anxiety? Are you free? Are you being set free from these things? Now, again, I'm not one of those people who's going to sit up here and say, if you pray hard enough, God's just going to, going to take care. Sometimes, yeah, God will take care of those things. But look at the last 5, 10, 15 years of your life. As you followed Christ, have you seen the shackles of the things that have held you in bondage be loosened, even gone away, set free? Are you, are you progressing in freedom? And I don't just mean doing what you want to do. That's not freedom. That's just a different kind of enslavement. That's called idolatry of self. I'm talking about are you being set free to pursue the very person that God has made you to be so that then you can be like Philip? And take whatever uh, powers, gifts, ability, influence. Those are all different kinds of power, right? We get scared to use the word power. We talk about it like it's sex. It's, it's like a dirty word. We'll use influence or leadership. It's power. It's power. You have power. I have power. Do you use that power that you've been given then to set other people free? Are you like Philip? There are all kinds of people around you. Every single day, you wake up, and they're in your house. You go to work, and they're in your office. You go to the grocery store, or you have it delivered. They're all there. All kinds of people are struggling with being enslaved to something. Maybe there's some people in your life that are just enslaved to discouragement, just constantly, perpetually discouraged. Every week is like, well, it was bad because of this. What are you doing to set them free from that? Offer up encouragement to them. To bless them with the powers and the gifts that you've been given by God. There are those who are addicted to the opinion of other people. They live and die by what other people think about them. If that's not enslavement, I don't know what is. Are you somebody who loves unconditionally those people around you, especially those people that are thirsty for the approval of other people? Or do you tell them, hey, I don't care what you do. I love you and I care for you. Are we setting people free? 
And then there's some of us in this room that have never tasted the freedom of the Holy Spirit because you have never known Jesus Christ. And I'm sitting here talking about this and you're like, I, I, I'm stuck. The power of God is a revolutionary power and it can come into your life today if you will put your faith in Jesus Christ. God wants a relationship with you. He desires you. He desires you so much that he sent his son to die for you. And if you will just put your faith in him, if you will just trust him rather than yourself, rather than the, the, don't trust your own power. It's not gonna be good enough. Trust the power of Christ to rescue you. Then the Holy Spirit comes in your life. And either instantly or probably more likely over a period of time, you'll see freedom setting you free from the things that hold you in bondage. Now, power is, is a funny thing because it doesn't just affect people that it's used on. It also has a, an effect on the people uh, that wield it. And so let's talk about another comparison, arrogance versus humility. Arrogance versus humility, verse 9. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. And they all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. Let's stop right there. We'll get to Philip in a second. So Simon uh, is an interesting person. Uh, we know some things about him and some things come more from church legend, right? So according to church legend, he's the guy that found, founds like the Gnostic heresies, okay? That's probably not true, uh, but that's kind of what people have thought. What we do know about him comes from a guy named Justin Martyr, obviously killed for his faith, not maybe, maybe a last name you don't want, and Irenaeus. And Justin Martyr was from Samaria, so he knew uh, they didn't live in the same time period, but he was aware of the history there. And Justin Martyr and Irenaeus both write that he was somebody that could actually do some sort of miraculous things. So much so that he was worshipped as an idol and as, and as a god in the city and in the area, even to the point where Rome put up a statue of him as a god. So he even had the Romans convinced. So it wasn't just a local podunk guy. This man was, was doing some things. We learned two things about him from this passage. One, he had some kind of power. He was able to do something. He wasn't just like a magician, like, you know, like with a card. That's not what he did. I, I've been working on it, and I can't get it to work. I really was hoping by this point I'd have it. I, don't, I got nothing. That would have been really cool, though. Just pretend it happened. Magic. He was powerful and, and probably derived his power and his ability from demonic power. Jesus himself was accused of using demonic power, so it's not unheard of. That obviously Jesus didn't use that, but it's not unheard of for Satan to empower people to do miraculous works so that he can distract people while he does things behind the scenes. He's like an organized crime leader, legitimate business front, evil things going on behind the scenes. The other thing we know about Simon is that Simon ran a legit PR campaign. Like he had like a social media manager, he had a PR firm, and they were all talking about how great Simon is. That's what's meant by he's the power of God that is called great. Like they were worshiping this dude. He had everybody convinced that he was the man. And that is what evil power does. Evil power, when it's used, when we use our power for evil, when not empowered by the Holy Spirit, we make ourselves look great. We build ourselves up. We get people to buy into us. We, we take care of our group of people, our friends, our family, to the exclusion of other people. And when a church does this, what do we want people to do? You need to come to Park City. Park City is the best. We don't like those other places. Those other places aren't good. But our place, we get the gospel right. We do things right here. Those other places don't. That's what self-aggrandizing, arrogant power does. You see, Simon worked magic. We like magic. Magic is cool, right? Again, just pretend I'm doing something. We like magic. You know why we like magic? It's not because it's power. It's because it's power to do something easily. To be able to wave a hand, make an incantation, and something appears. Now, we all are very sophisticated. This is the 21st century. We don't believe in magic anymore, right? Except you can have a device in your pocket. But you can pull it out, and you can say, Hey, Siri, again, an incantation... Hey, Siri, bring me lunch, and in 30 minutes, lunch, whoop, right there. Voila. You want to order me something? I don't like tomatoes. That's cool. Take your time. It'll be here probably just in time for us to finish up here. That's great. 
We like magic because it lets us do something easily. And when we want to do things easily, we usually want to aggrandize ourselves. We want to make ourselves look important. Simon was an incredibly gifted person who was gifted at glorifying himself. It's a powerful person. Power that comes from the Spirit is different. Power from the Spirit, it's humbling power. Because the Holy Spirit himself is someone who, as a member of the Trinity, as a part of the Trinity, a person in the Trinity, he glorifies and empowers God's people to glorify the Father and the Son. That's the role of the Spirit. That's what he does, one of the things he does. So what do we worship in? We worship in spirit and in, we're empowered truth. By the power of the Spirit, we worship. That's what he does. The Spirit of God is not about himself. Even Jesus Christ, right? Submitted himself, humbled himself before the Father and took on flesh. Using his power, his ability to do what? To set us free. The power of the Spirit is always a humble power. It's a, it's a, it's a diffusive power. It, 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 it doesn't stop with itself. And you see this in the passage too. Look at verse 8. Look at verse 8. I'm going to try and find verse 8. Here we go. Not verse 8. Where am I? Verse 12. There we go. But when they believed Philip, as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women, and even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip, and seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. See, Philip is doing the exact same thing Simon's doing. He's wielding power, and he's running a PR campaign. Here's the difference. Who's Philip pointing to? You are not set free by me. You are set free by the kingdom of God come upon you through the power of Jesus Christ. He's pointing to Jesus. He's pointing to Jesus. He's pointing to Jesus. Even to the point where he's working so many miracles that even Simon's like, I'm closing up shop. Let's get baptized. Let's go with you. Now, unfortunately, that's not where Simon's story ends, but we'll get there. We'll get there. Power from the Spirit is not about control. It's not about hoarding power. It's not about uh, possessing all the means of control. Power from the Spirit is a power that is diffused amongst people. It's a power that's shared. Maybe diffused isn't the right word. Because it's a power that's shared. And so when we think of sharing power, so if you have the ability to do something and I have the ability to do something, uh, if I empower you to do it, that means my power decreases and your Israel's increases. That's typically how we think about it. But that's not the way power works with the Holy Spirit. Because the Spirit of God cannot be divided. So you have just as much spirit as I have spirit. And uh, Andy Crouch uses this great example in his book. He talks about learning to play the cello. And when he's learning to play the cello, he goes to his neighbor's house, who's this master cello player, and he sits there and he learns. Now, as he learns to play the cello, this neighbor's power doesn't decrease, does it? No. His power stays the same, and Andy's grows. And so in the spirit of God, in the, in, in the church, as we empower more people to serve, uh, it's not like a democratic kind of power. We, we're, we diffuse power throughout so one person doesn't have control. No, no, no. That's not how the spirit of God works. He empowers each of us to serve and to minister and to care for the people around us. And as you become more empowered, my power doesn't decrease. And as I become more empowered, my power doesn't, your power doesn't decrease. It, it's, it's strengthening and growing and, and building the kingdom of God. And so we shouldn't hoard power. We shouldn't be so afraid of losing control. Somebody goes and finds uh, uh, the gospel of God working in another church. Praise God, may the spirit of God work. You come here and grow. Praise God, may the spirit of God work. Jesus Christ moves you on. Praise God. Go in with our blessing. We can't be possessive like that. So if you want to know whether or not the power and the gifting and the abilities you have is being used by the Spirit of God, if you are empowered by the Holy Spirit when you do what you do, think about whatever gifts, whatever talents, whatever abilities you have. Whenever you do what you do, does it result in people who are without power becoming more empowered or not? Because a lot of us use power to make other people powerful, but typically there are coworkers, there are friends, and there are family members. We take care of ours. But how many of us wield the gifts we have so that other people that are previously not empowered can become empowered? Those that don't have anything are set free. That's power in the spirit. So what does this look like? Well, one, it can look like empowering other people to teach. Empowering other people to teach. Connect group leaders. How often do you share the role of teacher 
And I don't mean just that one time you got to back up, you know, for July when you're at your house in Colorado or whatever. I mean, like, like do, do you have somebody that takes 30, 40% of the, of the workload? Not because you're tired or not because you can't do it, but so that they can become equipped so that then you or they can go on and do something else. Are you sharing that power? Are we as a church sharing power with, with people that traditionally don't have a voice of power? Are we sharing power with women in our church? Church history is kind of littered with uh, not so great record of empowering women. There's some really cool ladies in, in church history. But on the whole, not a great history. Are we empowering women to, to, to lead? I think we're doing a better job here at Park Cities. We're growing. I'm excited about it. What about injustice? Where do we see injustice flourishing and how are we addressing that? Are we empowering others to throw off their shackles? Empowering them to be free. That's what men of Nehemiah does. That's why we support them. What about prayer? Prayer is a, an amazingly powerful thing. If we believe that as a follower of Jesus, we have a unique relationship, we have a relationship with God, and that we can uh, go in boldly before the throne of God and ask him for whatever we want in accordance with the Spirit, if we believe that, why do we just use that to pray for ourselves and like our family? Why don't we use that to pray for work in the lives of other people, people that we don't know? How are you leveraging the power of prayer? Do that. Do that one thing, and I promise you, things will change. It has to. Now, there's a specific form of humility and arrogance comparison I want to make because the text goes here, and it's greed versus generosity. Greed versus generosity. Look at verse 14. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, real quick, just pause. Uh, there's, there's a little bit of a theological question that takes place here is, do you have to like, have a second experience of the Holy Spirit? Uh, in order to, so you become a Christian, and then there's like a second experience that takes place, and you receive the Holy Spirit. So as a church, we don't believe that. As, at Park Cities, we don't believe that. What we believe is that when you come to faith in Christ, boom, the Holy Spirit comes and sets up shop in your heart, and he lives there uh, forever, right? And he starts working and, and transforming your life, okay? So this is kind of a unique situation where uh, a new group of people are experiencing the Holy Spirit, and because the church is in its infancy, and it's typically, at this point, just a Jewish faith, Peter and John show up to kind of legitimize what's going on in Samaria. So it's kind of this unique thing to keep division and to keep fracturing in the church from happening. So they're kind of there approving. And on the very next scene, Philip is with an Ethiopian eunuch, and he proclaims Christ to him. He comes to Christ, and Philip, or Peter and John don't show up to lay hands on him. So this is kind of a unique setup that takes place. I wanted to point that out because there's a lot of debate. There's a lot of questions about this passage, right? So then we keep reading in verse 18. Now, when Simon saw that the spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven of you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what, I have said, of what you've said may come upon me. Look, Simon's greedy. And I don't know if his pursuit of power made him greedy or if his greed made him to pursue power. But either way, he is so greedy. And the saddest thing about his story is that Peter's like, hey, there's still a chance for you to fix this. You just gotta bring it before the Lord. And you know what happens? Simon's response is, can you just pray for me that these bad things don't happen to me? He didn't wanna give up what he's doing. He didn't wanna stop being the person he is. He just wants God to not be mad at him. He wants God to not hurt him. That is not a person of faith. That's not what happens to a person of faith. A person of faith, the power of God comes into life and they change. So what's the difference here? There seems to be a correlating relationship between greed and power. Doesn't necessarily always go hand in hand. Again, power is not a bad thing. Greed is. But wealth and power do definitely tend to go together, right? People have a tendency to monetize their power. They want to make money with what they can do, right? There's the old expression, right? If you can do something, don't ever do it for free. You knew it. You just were ashamed to say it. 
Don't ever do it for free. You always hear about the powerless poor, but you never hear about the powerless rich. Right, ah, oh, dude, that dude's so rich, he probably is so weak. Now, we never do that. Wealth and power, power and wealth go together, right? And we have a tendency to want more power, which means we have a tendency to want more wealth. That's what happened to Simon. That's what happened to Simon. But the, the, the apostles following Jesus, the, being empowered by the Spirit, affects you in a different way. Look what happens in verse 25. Now, when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. So what's really cool is, Peter and John go back home and like, they're like giving away the Spirit for free. Simon was going to buy it off of them. And they're like, no, the Spirit of God, that's not how he works. I'm giving it away. Giving the Spirit of God to whoever would take it. And here's the thing. We need to be careful with the way that we are generous. Because sometimes we use our generosity as a means to just purchase more power. Purchase more ability. Right? We, we, we give money to something, but we want to make sure they use it the way we, that we want them to, so we try to get on the board so we can control it. Or we give people money and we, we try to say what they're going to do with it. That is not generosity. That's just a way of buying more power and control. So how can we be generous? How can we be generous when we have one? Let's pray about how we use our money. We, we, the only time we really pray about money is when we don't have it. But we think about how we account it, we, we, we think about how we, we use it, how we spend it, uh, we, we, we're careful about how we save it. Do we pray about it to that extent? Pray about how you use your money. Also, think about and, and, and dwell on unconditional giving. Don't use your money as a means to control other people. Kids, if you get an allowance, you can throw this back in your parents' face. It's great. Like, you can't control me. No, I'm just kidding. Don't use that. That's an abuse of power, kids. The Spirit of God, He gives to us unconditionally. He gives it, I think all that God has given you, has blessed you with, has poured out upon you. And He doesn't say, now you have to go do this, this, and this, or I'm going to take it all away. That's not how God works. Now, yes, He asks us to follow Him, and yes, He asks us to love Him and to worship Him, sure. But He doesn't coerce us, He doesn't force us into it. It's not how God works. I understand there's, it's important to like know where your money's going and it, sometimes we do have to stop helping funding things that we disagree with. I get that. But don't fall into the trap of using your money as a stick to control people. And giving unconditionally might be a way to avoid that. So what does this all boil down to? I need to, I need to wrap up here. What does this all boil down to? The difference between the power of, of, of God working through his church and just power being self-focused is the difference between life and death. Throughout the scriptures, wherever the spirit goes, there's life. It starts in Genesis. What's hovering over the waters? It's the spirit of God. That's who's there. And then boom, for two chapters, life. And the Spirit of God desires to work in your life and in the lives of the people around you so that there can be life. You have power. Everybody in this room has some kind of ability, some kind of gifting, some kind of power. And if you are empowered by the Holy Spirit, guess what? You can use that power to bring life, flourishing, growth to people and things around you. Or you can use that exact same thing as a weapon to bring death. Which is it? Examine your lives. Brothers and sisters, examine your lives. Are you an instrument of death? The greatest things you have, and I fall into this trap a lot because I talk a lot. And sometimes the words that come out of my mouth are death to people. And I hate that. But I know when I'm following with Christ, when I'm walking with the Spirit of God, you know what happens? This thing that gets me in trouble so much, and it does, life starts coming out of there. My kids are built up. My wife is built up and encouraged. The people here as I'm speaking, are changed. And it's not me. It's the Spirit of God using something that I have, the ability to run my mouth. What do you have that God can use to set people free, to humble yourself? How can you be generous with it? And how can you bring life with the power that you have? That's the power that the Holy Spirit wants to use and enable and empower. And when all of us start doing that, the church flourishes and the people in the church flourish. Let us be full of the Spirit of God and may he use the things that we've been blessed with. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much.
for the way that you have blessed and gifted us. You've gifted us so well, so many things. It's an embarrassment of riches. So Lord God, I pray that you would take something that each of us has, some ability, some talent, some gift, some resource that we have, and may you set it to work for the building of your kingdom. May it bring life and not death, freedom, not enslavement. And may it humble us as well as we use it generously. Because you use your life generously, Lord Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.